to Catholic Faith Forum. I am Nonso Igwe. And today we'll be talking about perceived fraudulence, also known as imposter syndrome. I mean, you would agree with me that a lot of young people feel like they do not measure up. I mean, how, what am I doing here? Am I good enough? All these questions going on in their mind. And this doesn't only exist in uh, organized um, environments like schools or offices even in families and even churches as well. And that's what we'll be talking about on today's show. Don't go anywhere. When we come back from the short break, we'll meet our guests and get right to our discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Catholic Faith Firm. And today we'll be talking about imposter syndrome and how to overcome it. Joining my discussion today is Titila Yomi. Dairy. I want to call your name in full so that everyone will know. Titi Layomi, how are you, Titi? I'm good. And you? I'm good too. So today we'll be talking about imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? Oh, well, simply put, it's, um, you know, perceived fraud, right? And you just feeling like, you know, you are, um, you know, you don't deserve, you know, what you have or yeah. you know, any of your achievements. And, you know, it's just doubting yourself. Basically. Yeah, so what does it feel like to have it? Ah, I'm asking you now, because I know that I've entered you before, so I know. <laughs> so what does it feel like to have this? It's scary. Okay. It's very scary. Um, and um, if, if you're someone, you know, who also has anxiety episodes, it's, it's madness. Can it lead to that? Do you, um, don't you think so? I wouldn't say it would lead to that, to be honest, but I would say that... Um, anxiety depression you know all of it you know it's, it's like a total package you know it's something that would birth it right um it's you know imposter syndrome as it is it's not um it's not a mental issue per se you know it's just psychological right but it's something that could you know it enhances or um, your anxiety episodes depression as yeah, well as stress yeah, yeah. yeah so for instance we say that um um some ages, what are the ages that are prone to this? We know for a fact, young people like us are always asking questions. Am I supposed to be here? I don't fit here. What should I do? So what are the ages that this art of this, um, um, this syndrome is common? Yeah, I, I would say, um, honestly, almost every age from 12, 12 to i think 35. Mm -hmm. I, I would believe that you know by 36 or 40 yeah they are now gotten, stable, yeah you know although you know some people still have triggers here and there and the reason for that is that you know from 12 years old you're more aware you're more conscious about the things around you you know you know when um um, someone is doing better than you in class, you mm -hmm. know? but it's it's just a bit it's subtle. Then I think the age that would suffer this the most um, the most is from 20, 20 21, Um, you're a young person starting out your career, you know. Then it's 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 extreme. Yeah, now at that age you're like, huh, I don't think I I fit in here. I think they would find out I'm not good enough. Not good know. enough, yeah. yeah. Then, you know, the stress and we don't exactly exist in an enabling environment. So that also adds some level of pressure. And um, if you, your background, you know, could also add to it, you know. So yeah, anywhere from 12 to 35. So what are some, like, me? I'm thinking of the triggers of this syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like you just mentioned, your environment places you grew up in? What are some other um, triggers? Um, I think what you consume mm. would be a trigger. How? I will give you a good example. One day, uh, so I used to be a very good LinkedIn fan. Because... You are still a good LinkedIn fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Um, but now I'm more conscious. Okay. Um, you know, I would go there, you know, just to see, okay, what are people doing? You make yourself sad. You know, let me see. But man, yes, I was making myself sad. Sad is even better. I was, I was, you know, digging a hole for myself. I would, you know, just go through and it's like, oh, this person went to this school. I went to that school. This person is, you know, is, you know, there's career progression. You know, you can see. You can it. see. You, it, you, yeah. And then you're like, what am I doing? And then, so it, it's almost like, you forget all the good things you've done. And I wouldn't say good things per se, but like your own little steps, your baby steps, you forget your process. And then you sort of just idolize that person's um, achievements. And you're like, Ugh. 
and then one day when you get a promotion you're like um, mm, exactly nah, yeah. i think that that person should get it you know so yes what you consume could you know also trigger it's linkedin it doesn't have to be linkedin right um it could be instagram you see somebody just started out and then they have a car you know so many things but then we're like getting we more also... aware i mean there's fake life here and there and all that mm. now you will still be surprised that you know even <laughs> now that we're getting more aware yeah. there's fake life and you're like ah, ah auntie is not true you know in the midst of that you still see there's still that mm, but does the person have two heads exactly mm. you know, that kind of thing there so I've, I've heard some arguments of people saying oh at least in every person there should be a little bit of imposter syndrome because it helps you grow helps you measure or weigh your way where you're doing well and where you're not doing well how true do you how do you do you agree with this? Okay, so yes, I, I would understand why, you know, that argument would, you know, would comfort or I sympathize with that person, let me say it <laughs> that way. Yes. And the reason being that, okay, yes, you check yourself. You're like, okay, I don't want to be a fraud or to be seen as a fraud. So let me, you know, work on my skills. Let me probably get more certificates. And all mm -hmm. that. But it's a problem when you say imposter syndrome is good. If you had told me that at the time of my life where that was like... I was living in that bubble, right? Mm. I would be like, you must hate me. So I wouldn't say imposter syndrome is good. I would say it's good to constantly check yourself, you know, to, you know, prepare, you know, and, you know, also like, okay, if you have gaps here and there, right? Okay, in your skills, in terms of qualification, there are things you need to do better. Yeah. It's good to, you know, own your skills and, you know, just be good at what you do, right? I would say confidence in just knowing that, okay, I think I'm good, mm. right? It's, it's better than saying imposter syndrome, syndrome has this good side. No, no, no. Uh, okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> when we come back from this short break, we'll continue our discussion. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Still Catholic Faith Firm, and we're talking about imposter syndrome and how to overcome it. So talking about... Um, where I just asked the question if imposter syndrome is good, as I've heard the argument. But then I'm now thinking about it. Are there degrees of imposter sy syndrome? In some people, is it higher than the others? Does how does I mean, are there degrees to this? Oh well, yes. There, yes, there are degrees to it. Um, well, according to um, statistics, you know, um women, more women have this, you know, close to 70% of women would, you know, battle with imposter syndrome. Yes. Um, but in terms of degree, I think there are, and, and I think, again, it also depends on the situation, right? Uh, for me, it was battling, oh, okay, I just got into this new position as a junior, a junior role, right? And it was like, huh? I'm not good here. Or, it was yeah. obvious I wasn't good. And that sort of triggered my, you know, it just made my anxiety go over the roof, right? And at that point in time, it was like, this is hell, right? But in someone else, it could just be like, eh, someone invited me to talk at a show. I'm not too sure, sure I can if do I that. can do that. Can so, you know, them? depending on, you know, the um, situation at the time, you know, um, you know, the degree could be heightened or, you know, less than that. You spoke about imposter syndrome affecting women more. And in cases like this, how does a person, I mean, overcome this or how do I tackle it when it's, uh, when my imp imposter syndrome is as a result of maybe my age or gender or race? Yeah, I think um, having a support system helps. Okay. Yes, and and in order for you to identify your support system, you know you need to voice out. You just need to say it anyhow. But when you mean support system, what do you mean? So support system could mean a friend like you. <laughs> It could oh, mean that's so cute. it could mean a, a, you know your colleagues, okay. um, a superior. It could mean a family. It could be someone at church. You know, it could be it could be anyone. You know, and it's also understanding that support system isn't like a book. It's standing on a shelf and you just go. And, no, it's like you look at this person and you're like I think this person can help me. And it's not like they they take you from one position and move you to one. No, no, no it's not instant. But they can help your journey. They can recite your achievements for you and i think that was one of the things that i love about my friends up to the point where they say titi this is this is me saying you did well in this say thank you don't say no i'm not too sure mm -hmm. say thank you own it because 
you did it, you know, it's reality, it's facts, right? We didn't just get it off the shelf or anything. So that's a support system in someone, someone that would always cheer your biggest cheerleader. And it could be anyone, right? And it doesn't even just have to be one, one person. One person, yeah. Like a group of people. As long as they, you know, they can say, okay, I think you should get better at this. But you did great, you know, it's not bad. But it can be better, but it's not bad, right? You know, that's a support system. And you don't get that kind of thing if you are, you know, bottling everything, you know, you but have to talk. You said something that um, has struck something in me now. I feel like most people who go through this, are they just need some accolades. So even when you're saying you're speaking on support system, I'm also thinking that the other party, I mean, your, your work, your, your office where you work, whatever you do, they should also recognize your value or the value you're bringing to the system such that even if they don't give, give you accolades, I mean, you can get some kind of energy from them that shows that they appreciate you. So do, you, do we then say that um, this arises, that imposter syndrome will arise as a result of a person not being appreciated in an environment? Well, you know, that's... That would also add to it. Mm -hmm. But I but I'll ask a question. What's the good of, you know, um accolades when in your mind you are telling yourself, I'm not good enough. Good you enough. know, so I mean I could tell you, I know, so you know, you're you're Nigeria's best, you know, presenter. But in your head, you're already thinking, God, you're going to find out I don't even have a degree in this. I haven't even I haven't been doing this for 10 years. I, I mean, I just started, like, exactly. I'm winging this thing. So what good would, you know, a paper or a card of achievement do at that point in time? Yes, it's very important that organizations, homes, uh, marriages, you know, and I'm just trying to pick at, you know, mm -hmm. diff different institutions, you know, yeah. yeah, institutions that, you know, um, your environment, right? It's very good that you're appreciated. But it's also very good that you learn to accept it because that's like the evil that imposter syndrome does. Mm. It tells you that what every other person is saying is a lie. And what you are thinking in your head is the truth, you know. So you can be, you know, giving me a compliment. Oh, wow, you did very good. And I'm, I'm still thinking, ah, no, I didn't read enough. I didn't, I don't think I did well. I didn't present so well. Like, I, and you're giving me a compliment, but I can't say yeah. it, you know. You know, so you need to own it. You, you yourself have to work on yourself. Thank you so much. We have to hold that thought there. Don't go anywhere. We have to learn a little about that saint today, Saint Dimphna. Stay with us. Today we are talking about Saint Dimphna. Dimphna was born in Ireland sometime in the 7th century to a pagan father and a devout Christian mother. When she was 14, she consecrated herself to Christ and took a vow of chastity. Soon afterward, her mother died and her father, who had loved his wife deeply, began to suffer a rapid deterioration of his mental stability. Her father, Damon, sent messengers throughout his town and other lands to find a woman of noble birth who resembled his wife and would be willing to marry him. But when none could be found, his evil advisors whispered sinful suggestions to marry his own daughter. So twisted were Damon's thoughts that he recognized only his wife when he looked upon Dimphna. And so he consented to the arrangement. When she heard of her father's misguided plot, Dimphna fled her castle with her confessor, a priest named Gerbran, two trusted servants and the king's fool. Though it becomes uncertain what exactly happened next, the best-known version claims that they settled in Gil, where Dimphna built a hospital for the poor and the sick. But in using her wealth, her father was able to discover her location. When Damon found his daughter, he was in Belgium, but he traveled to Gil and captured them. He ordered the priest's head to be separated from his body and attempted to convince Dimphna to return to Ireland and marry him. When Dimphna refused, Damon became enraged and drew his sword. He struck Dimphna's head from her shoulders and left her dead. When she died, Dimphna was only 15 years old. After her father left Gil, the residents collected both Dimphna and Gerbrand's remains 
and lay them to rest in a cave. In defense of her purity, Dimfna received the crown of martyrdom around the year 620 and became known as the Lily of Ayr. In 1349, a church honoring Saint Dimfna was built in Gil, and by 1480, so many pilgrims were arriving in need of treatment for mental ills that the church was expanded. The expanded sanctuary was eventually overflowing again, leaving the townspeople to accept them into their homes, which began a tradition of care for the mentally ill that continues to this day. Many miracles have been proven to take place at her shrine in the church erected in her honor, and her remains were placed in a silver reliquary in the church. Some of her remains can also be found at the shrine to St. Dimphna in the United States. St. Dimphna is the patroness of those suffering nervous and mental afflictions, as well as victims of incest. Welcome back. This is Kali Faith Firm. Thank you so much, Chima, for that. As we were saying, going back to um, support systems now, there was something you said that actually, and I now felt that, oh, okay, this is contradicting themselves. First of all, you said, um, we're talking about accolades from the institutions or, I mean, the other party, and then getting accolades from the support systems, remember? So I'm now thinking, if I cannot internalize all of these accolades and say, oh, okay, because they say I'm doing well, then I'm doing well. Doesn't that now defeat the purpose of the support system? Okay, so be a support system is different. Okay. Right? Um, the institution, you know, they don't really have that relationship with you. It's still more of, you know, it's very distant. Official, so it's like, yeah. a, so, okay, yeah, you did well in this, that's good. Your support system will shake you. They will look you in the eye and say, no, so snap out of it. You know, they will tell you, um, the next time I say you, you did something where you say thank you, you own it. You know, they will go deeper into it. They will ask you, what is the problem, you know? Where is this coming from? Where is this thought coming from? You know, and they say, okay, you feel you are not good in this. Do you think you should work on it? You know, they 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 connect with you deeper, right? So that's why I said support system. I didn't just randomly say, ah, oh, your colleague. Anybody, work. okay? You know, so so anybody can say you did well, and you can say, oh, I'm not too sure. Hmm. If someone walks up, if I walk up to you <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you you did well, I will shake it. I will make it sink into your head. You know, a support system would always go the extra mile mm, okay. till you accept it. Now oh, I see, I see. So how do you um, measure, like I'm now thinking, how can I measure my improvement? We talked about recording the things you've done well. So how can I measure my improvement so that I don't get to a point where I'm saying, oh, no, I don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll tell you how I measured my mm, improvement. Nice. Okay, so one time in conversation with Anyete. Yeah, fine. <laughs> with, in conversation with him, you know, I, uh, we, we made an agreement. And it was like, the next time, you know, we do something well, even if it's as little as, or we finish the deck presentation, right? We say, you did well. Yeah. You did well. And we say, thank you. Is that why you always tell yourself you did well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And but I was able to measure success and improvement. The moment when I told someone, "Oh, you did so well," and the person was like, "No, I'm not." I said, "Snap out of it," you know, because yeah. I remembered that conversation, and I, you know, I was able to identify. No, 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 no. <laughs> we are not going to go around this cycle of madness again. You will accept that you did well because you did, you know, and you know you are good, good at it, right? And, you know, no one would replace. I mean, at that point in time, you were the perfect person for the job. I was like, no, snap out of it. Because I remember my conversation with this person and we promised ourselves that this is what we would always do. And it was like, good. When I got home that day, I was like, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing well. Okay. All right, yes. So that's how you measure um, improvement. Another thing, which I learned from Tiwa Ogunesi. Yeah, no, that's your, that's your... Yes. She I'll really tell everyone, that's me. her room model. <laughs> No, but she really helped me. And she me won't build. let me rest. I won't let anyone rest. <laughs> <laughs> she okay. helped me view my confidence. And um, there's this monthly win tracker. You can download it on our website. And um, you, you record your small wins and the big wins. And your small wins could be as little as um, arranging your bookshelf. Yeah. It could be as, you know, organizing things. It could be as, you know, 
you know, just closing your tabs. It could be something very little, right? And your big wins could actually be, you know, talking to someone, you know, helping or someone. Speaking to your boss speaking freely, to someone yeah. Freely, you know, and, and the moment I started doing that, it was like, Okay. You're doing well. I am doing well. <laughs> I, you know, I was able to keep track. And so when someone says, oh, you're doing well, I'm like, I know. I remember. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm good at it. Ah, yeah. Nice. So how can you recognize imposter syndrome in others and help them? Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you, you um, I think you really need to discern. Sometimes it could actually not be imposter syndrome, you know, mm -hmm. and you, you also need to understand where you need to get things right. Say, for example, I need to get better at, you know, uh, my strategy work, for example, so research and all of that, right? And the person like, oh, I didn't do so well. You know, you look and you access the situation, you're like, okay, maybe the person actually does need to, you know, get better. Get that better. might not be a situation of imposter syndrome. You can identify it, you know, and it's really by discerning, you know, the Holy Spirit to tell you, hmm, that's something there. We don't want to, you know, have that pattern again, you know. And helping the person is not like, you know, it's also understanding that it's not the same process, you know, that would for work for everyone. Yeah. But it's just helping them find the root of the matter. The root of the matter could be work. It could be from the house, you know, the background, you know, their upbringing. Race, yeah. Maybe it's more of like, you should not get first class or the first position in class you know you are not good enough kind of thing so the moment you can help them trace the origin it would help you you know say okay i think we could try this i think we could try and always stay with them you know be ready to have calls at midnight saying i don't think i did this well <laughs> <laughs> be ready for it because that's what it means to be a support system they would not call their boss who gave them an award yeah. understand that you're a support system because i'm not trying to say your time is worthless to you but you're a support system because they know that i can pick up the phone and call this person at any point in time and this person will call my spirits hmm. so you are ready for work it's not easy work <laughs> it's not easy work at all yeah thank you so much it's been a wholesome conversation between my friend and i <laughs> thank you so much let's not go anywhere let's me know your fate team stay with us Hello and welcome to another exciting and wonderful episode of Know Your Faith series. As you know, I am Collins and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the history of the Roman collar. Now, one of the most distinctive items worn by priests outside of the vestments at Mass is what many call the Roman collar or the collarino. This is usually worn with a black shirt as part of the clerical street attire. Now, the clerical collar is an item adorned as part of Christian clerical clothing. It is detachable and buttoned onto a clergy shirt. It is fastened by a few metal studs attached to the front and back to hold it to the shirt, like this. So the collar closes at the back of the neck, presenting a seamless front. Now, it is a sign of the person's religious calling and helps others in the community to identify them regardless of their faith. Worn by priests around the world, the clerical collar is a narrow, stiff and upright white collar that fastens at the back. Historically speaking, collars started to be worn around the 6th century as a way of, for clergy to be easily identified outside of the church. Now, the collar is white and made of cotton or linen as it is more comfortable to wear than those available in plastic and prevents chaffing. Now, the clerical shirt is usually black or a color that is appropriate to a person's ministry ranking. Now, it started with the black coat and a white necktie, which has been worn for some, which had been worn for, for some decades. Now, by the 1880s, this had been transmuted into the clerical collar, which was worn almost constantly by the majority of the clergy for the rest of the period. The clerical collar was adopted by other Christian denominations, including the Anglican Church, the Methodist Churches, Eastern Orthodox Churches, the Baptist Churches, Lutheran Churches, and the Roman Catholic prior to the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. The practice of Roman Catholic clergy wearing the clerical collar as street dress tended to be found only in those countries where Catholicism was like the minority religion. 
Now, in 1960s, many clergy who lived in countries where Catholicism was the dominant religion began to wear the clerical collar rather than the cassock. Now, the canon law states that clerics are to wear suitable ecclesiastical dress in accordance with the norms established by the Episcopal Conference and legitimate local customs. Now, in the United States, Bishop at the 1884 Council of Baltimore decided that priests should wear black, preferably cassocks. They chose cassocks since that, since that was what missionaries had won. Now, after the reforms of Vatican II, suits became more common. And in 1999, the US bishops issued a directive that outside of liturgical functions, a black suit and a Roman collar should be the clerical apparel for priests. The cassock is worn at the discretion of the cleric, and in the Catholic Church, the clerical collar is worn by all ranks of clergy, the bishops, priests, deacons, and often by seminarians who have been admitted to candidacy for the priesthood, as well as with their cassocks during the liturgical celebrations. And so that's it for today, guys. I'm pretty sure that you've been able to understand the reason why you can meet a priest outside of the church and he's wearing what you think is just a suit and something that looks white-ish, right? So feel free to like, subscribe, and share our contents. And until I come your way next time, be bold and be Catholic. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Know Your Faith team, for that. Thank you, Titi Layo, for being here today. Welcome. I hope you come some other time. Of course. <laughs> I know you've learned something. You've learned one or two things from our episode today. You can watch this episode and other episodes on our YouTube channel at Dominican Media Presents. Also, kindly support us, send us your donations. Um, and you can do this by reaching out to us with the email and the phone number showing on the screen below. You can also send your questions, your suggestions, anything you want to do. Just send it to us on our social media platform at CFF on TV. Till I come your way next time, keep being saints in jeans and shirts. Bye. Did you say bye? <laughs>